What's up, you guys? I'm Haley. And I'm Andrea. And this is Inhuman, a true crime podcast. All right. So before we dive into the case today, I just want to remind you all to send us any personal stories that you guys have. Um, It can be literally anything, something you've experienced personally, or even a friend's story with their permission. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But literally anything, ghost-related, true crime-related, anything, send them our way. And you can email them to us at inhumanmonsterpod at gmail.com. Yes. So don't forget to do that. And we're just going to get into the case because this is going to be a long one. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So the case I'm covering today It's one that I've actually been perplexed by for years. This is one that, you know, when people say, like, what's one case that you would want to know what happened? Like, what really happened? Yeah. My top three are this one, Jean Bonnet, and Bryce Laspisa. Ooh, okay. So when you told me you were doing this case, I did not look it up. I I recognize the name, but I brain dead completely on the details okay so i'm sure i've heard it but i'm excited to hear your take on it and oh that makes me excited cool okay (laughs) i try not to do that because like i don't want to ruin it for myself you know even if i I know the case yeah. yeah yeah same but yeah so i've been perplexed by this for years but it was suggested to us by allison and when i saw that come into our inbox i think i texted you right away and i was like i, I want to do this. i want to cover this <laughs> yeah because i was like i've been thinking of wanting to cover this but like yeah. wasn't gonna do it for a while because i knew it would involve a lot of research yeah. so but when allison suggested it i was like i gotta do it so thank you allison and today we are going to be covering the disappearance of lauren spear yes And I went way into this case. Like, I dove down pretty much every rabbit hole that there was. (laughs) So buckle in. Um, And I'll tell you from now, this, in case you haven't heard of this case before, it is unsolved. And there are a lot of theories that I'll be going into. And we're going to be going through all of them. Yeah. Grab a snack. Take a road trip. Whatever. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Get get ready for it because it's going to be a long one. But it'll be good. I'm actually really proud of my research into this. So I hope that it turns into a good episode. Awesome. I'm sure it is. All right. So Lauren Spear was born to Robert and Charlene Spear on January 17th, 1991 in New York. Lauren grew up in Scarsdale, New York, which is a wealthy town in the Westchester County area of New York. So this is like known for being a pretty wealthy area. Okay. Growing up, Lauren was very active with her Jewish faith. She attended a summer camp called Camp Tawanda as a kid. And um, there she met a friend, Jay Rosenbaum, and her future boyfriend, Jesse Wolf. And they actually both ended up going to college with Lauren years later. Okay. So she was very active in her faith. This camp was, you know, surrounding the Jewish faith. And she met those two and several other future college friends at at Camp Tawanda. Okay. Lauren was a very petite woman. Uh, I didn't hear it, but your reaction. And that's not the door, right? No. <laughs> what, what was the... it? Fuck. Was that the Hold window? On, go look out the window. Hold okay. on. It's not even spooky season anymore, guys. <laughs> I have no fucking clue what that was, but that was so scary. Was it outside? I think so. And that's like your backyard, right? It's my front yard. Oh, it's your front yard. Okay. Hmm. I don't know, but okay. <laughs> okay. So, as I was saying... Lauren was a very petite woman. She was 4'9 and like 90 or 95 pounds. Oh so my she goodness. was tiny. Teeny tiny. Yeah. And this was the time at the time she disappeared. So she was like 20 years old. Okay. She also had a heart condition called long QT syndrome, which according to an ABC News article about her disappearance, it is, quote, a heart rhythm disorder for which she sometimes needs medication. This disorder can cause uncontrollable and dangerous arrhythmias. Oh. So Lauren had this condition for 
like a lot of her life. I couldn't find exactly when she was diagnosed with it, but okay. she had it for a while and she was taking medication for it. Okay. And that'll be kind of important later, so just keep that in mind. In 2009, Lauren graduated from Edgemont High School in New York and enrolled at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. And this is one of the main reasons why, when I saw this case suggested, I wanted to cover it, because I went to Purdue, which is Indiana, or IU's big rival. So Purdue and IU are like big rivals. Um, I know a lot of people that went to IU. I've been there. And we also like during games and stuff, we would say IU sucks during like football games, (laughs) basketball games. That was like our thing. And then also during the chorus of Sweet Caroline, when we would sing it at the piano bar on Thursday nights. So um, (laughs) we would always like say IU sucks. It was a thing. So, you know. That's funny. Big rival. And actually, the wedding that I was at last weekend, the groom went to IU. Oh. So, yeah. And they actually got engaged at IU. And they also, <laughs> um, he and then my friend Megan, the bride, they have been to the bar that Lauren was at that night oh, wow. multiple times. So, like, they've talked about it. They've sent me photos from there. So it's just kind of eerie. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. So that's kind of one of the reasons that this case has stuck with me for so long, and I'm glad that I'm able to share her story through this episode. But anyway, enough about me and my college life. (laughs) Lauren was studying textiles and merchandising, or basically fashion design, at IU, and she became very active in the Jewish community on campus. And the spring break before she disappeared, she even traveled to Israel to plant trees with the Jewish National Fund. Oh my gosh, that's like a bucket list place I want to visit. That's amazing. On June 2nd, 2011, Lauren was 20 years old and she had just finished her sophomore year at IU and she was ready to, you know, celebrate being done with the school year. And just a little bit of background info on IU in case you don't know what the scene is there. It's a very good school. It's strong in academics. It's known for having a good basketball team, which Purdue is better, but that's beside the point. (laughs) I'm a very big Purdue basketball fan, if you didn't know. Our dog is literally named after the basketball arena, so. (laughs) But aside from all of that, IU is also known for being kind of a party school. It has been ranked over the years as the top party school from various different outlets. You know, there's always these outlets saying the top party school or the top whatever. Yeah. So it's been ranked. And students that go there are known for liking to party. Of course, not everybody. And they're still really good students. And it's still a really good school. But it is also known as having, like, a good party scene. Okay. And the town that's that it's in, Bloomington, is not very big. So kind of picture like a small college town feel where things are nearby, the bars are within walking distance of your apartment, and in Lauren's case, you're excited to go out and celebrate the end of another school year. Okay. So it was Friday night, and Lauren and her friends were hanging out drinking I think it was the NBA finals was happening and so they were watching one of the games and or something and they were excited to just kind of blow off some steam so I'm first going to go through basically the timeline that has been put together both through witness statements and through surveillance footage and then I'll talk through you know the actual investigation and what happened afterwards okay and that's of that night yep okay And quickly, before we get into the timeline, I want to introduce you guys to a couple of the people that are involved in the story because it can get kind of confusing. So I hope that this, I'm going to just like share who they are. So hopefully it'll make it a little easier to follow. Okay. So first up, we have Jesse Wolf, who I mentioned at the beginning. Jesse was Lauren's boyfriend, who she had met at Camp Tawanda years prior. So at this point, they'd been together for about three years, and Jesse was also a student at IU. Jesse and Lauren loved each other, and Jesse was kind of described as being her protector. They were very close, and they had actually been planning to travel back to the East Coast for the summer, where their families lived not far from each other. So they were planning to travel together back. They were very close, good relationship on all accounts. Like best friends, but also dating. Yeah. Okay. And on the night of June 2nd, this night that 
Lauren disappeared. Jesse did not go out with Lauren. He was watching the NBA Finals game. Um, So he was at home, but he was texting back and forth with Lauren a little bit throughout the night until he went to bed. Okay. Next up, we have Jason or Jay Rosenbaum. So this is the other friend that she met at camp years before, and they were now good friends at IU. And Jay lived in a townhouse located at Five North Townhomes, which was in downtown Bloomington, not far from the bars. And it was about two blocks from Lauren's apartment. Okay. Next up, we have Corey Rossman and Michael or Mike Beth. Corey and Mike lived, I think, one door down from Jay. And they had actually just met Lauren a few days earlier at the Indy 500. So they were friends with Jay and met Lauren through him. Okay. And Corey is a, 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 ma- a male, I'm assuming. A man. Yes. Okay. A man. Yep. Okay. And then finally, we have David Roan. This guy is a neighbor and friend of Lauren's, and he comes into play for like just a hot second. So I just wanted to mention him. Okay. So that's the group. The night of June 2nd, Lauren had been invited by Jay to a party at his townhouse. And this is now technically the early morning hours of June 3rd. So it's like late Friday night turns into like really early Saturday morning. Okay. At around 1230 a.m., witnesses report seeing Lauren leaving her apartment with her friend David Roan. And the two headed to Jay's apartment where they started drinking. And Corey and Mike were also there at the party. One source claimed that during the party, Lauren and Corey were hanging out. And this source claimed that Corey wanted to hook up with Lauren. And remember, she has a boyfriend. Right. And he wasn't there that night. And I couldn't confirm this other than that one source. But I did want to mention it. Jay also claimed that either David or Lauren told him that they had snorted clonopin, which is a sedative anti-anxiety medication. Oh. And then Jay said that whichever one of them told him this also said that they had done cocaine. Oh. Which, like, that doesn't really That's make a sense lot. <laughs> if you're, like, doing, like, snorting a Downer. sedative. Yeah. yeah, but people do that, like, especially if they're, like, drinking and partying, which is a terrible mm-hmm. idea because it leads mm-hmm. to, like, blacking out and passing right. out and heart no. roller coaster. Yeah, not a good idea. Exactly. Don't do it. Yeah, and this was, this has only come from Jay reporting this, and he also can't remember if it was Lauren or David who told him this, which, which makes is weird. a lot of people suspicious. Yeah, yeah. like... They're very, very different. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But he was also intoxicated. So who knows? He might just remember somebody telling him that but not know who it was. Right. So I think that this could be important if it's true because we know Lauren had that heart condition. So like you just said, doing drugs and especially mixing drugs with drinking can definitely mess with your heart. Absolutely. So... That definitely potentially could be dangerous to her. And then the other thing that a lot of people talk about is if David was the one who said it, maybe Lauren didn't know exactly what she was taking, you know, Mm. and that could have been dangerous to her as well. Right. But we don't know who said it. We don't know if Jay is even telling the truth, but it is something that investigators learned later that fits into this timeline. Okay. So David was seen on surveillance footage re-entering his apartment building not long after he left with Lauren, and he wasn't seen leaving again until 11 a.m. the next day. So he pretty much was never suspected to play any part in Lauren's disappearance, and he's gone. Okay. At one point, Lauren and Corey left the party at Jay's and went down to Corey's townhouse two doors down. And Corey's roommate, Mike, said that both Lauren and Corey were visibly very intoxicated at this point, but they wanted to go out and drink more. Mm. At 1.46 a.m., Lauren entered Kilroy's sports bar, and this was seen on surveillance footage. And this is a very popular sports bar in downtown Bloomington, not far from the townhouse that they were just at. While at the bar, it's believed that Corey was buying Lauren drinks because remember, she's only 20 years old. Oh, yeah, that's true. So there's some speculation that she was maybe using a fake ID, but more people report that he was buying her drinks. And I think that's what a lot of people believe happened. Okay. 
And while at the bar, we also know that Lauren took off her shoes when she went out onto, they have like a sand covered outdoor patio. So she took off her shoes when she was out there and ended up leaving her shoes there. Mm. And she also left her phone at Kilroy's. So that just shows you, like, how intoxicated she was. Right. At 2.27 a.m., Lauren was seen on surveillance exiting Kilroy's with Corey, who then walked with her to her apartment. And three minutes later, they were seen on surveillance entering her apartment complex, which is called the Smallwood Plaza Apartments. When they got off the elevator at the fifth floor where Lauren's apartment was, they ran into some guys that allegedly were some friends... Of Jesse's, Lauren's boyfriend. Okay. So there are reports that one of these guys, who's named Zach Oaks, noticed how intoxicated Lauren was and asked if she was okay. And remember, she doesn't have her shoes. She doesn't have her cell phone. She was stumbling around. So I'm sure she looked very drunk. And she was with a guy she had just met like two days before, right? Right. Okay. And apparently, Corey responded to Zach something like, she's okay. I got, I got it. And Zach claims that he then said something like, okay, great, just get her home, to which Corey responded by cursing at him. And then Zach said that he was concerned that Corey was trying to take advantage of Lauren. Yeah. And so after this response, Zach punched Corey in the (laughs) face. Okay. (laughs) So I'm thinking it was more of a, like, he pissed him off, but Zach was also trying to look out for Lauren, and that's why he got pissed off, and then he punch Corey in the face right and that would also make sense if Zach was friends with Jesse because it's like this guy that is with you your know, friend's the girlfriend, girlfriend of one of my buddies yeah. yeah but this punch apparently left Corey bruised and a bit disoriented okay and there's some speculation that this hit to Corey's head affected his memory around what happened the rest of the night and later we'll kind of find out who said that and a little more about that all right now after this altercation which according to police was seen on surveillance cameras but they've never released that footage or you know confirmed exactly what happened which is kind of a running theme through this case they've only released one photo of lauren but as you'll see over the next like couple of timestamps, we she was seen on surveillance multiple times yeah and i get like them not wanting to release it right away But it's been 10 years. Yeah, that's true. So. Because the more they release, the the more possibilities there are that someone will come forward with information. Exactly. Like, maybe somebody didn't realize that the person that they saw that night was Lauren. Yeah. And then they might see the surveillance and remember something. Right. But but anyway. (laughs) We don't know why they do the things they do. (laughs) Exactly. So, this was apparently seen on surveillance cameras, but... Regardless, Lauren and Corey then turned around and left her apartment building instead of going into her apartment that was right there. Okay, so so the friends let her leave with the guy? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So they're on the fifth floor where her apartment is, and they, after this altercation, decided to turn around and leave, which... Some of the, like, things that I've read and listened to about this case, people are saying that maybe, and this is all alleged, you know, we don't know, and they're saying maybe Corey was trying to take advantage of her and knew, oh, well, now these guys know that I'm here. Yeah, like, if if they call Jesse and Jesse comes over, I'm screwed, so we're going to go back to my place. That's what I'm going to assume, too, because he's known this girl for a couple of days. He's doesn't owe her taking her home like yeah there are right nice guys out there who will do that um but chances are he was trying to trying to get something out of out of it yep that's what a lot of people think yeah so either way they were seen exiting the elevator at the lobby where lauren was seen stumbling still and Corey like steadied her Outside the complex, about a block away, a witness reported seeing Lauren sitting on some concrete steps when she stood up, but then lost her balance and fell backwards. And apparently the woman asked Lauren if she needed help, but once again, Corey responded for Lauren that she was fine and he was taking care of her. Wow. Lauren was then seen on camera entering an alley at 2.48 a.m. An alley? 
Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. This alley ran between College Avenue and Morton Street, and security cameras from a nearby apartment complex saw her exit the alley at 2.51 a.m. And she was walking towards an empty lot. She was still with Corey, and her purse and keys were later found in that alley. So she likely dropped them. So how long, so the time they went into the alley to the time that they were seen exiting the alley, how long was that? Like three minutes. Oh, okay. So not enough time for like, well, maybe. But no, probably, probably not. not. <laughs> yeah. They, it was more like they were walking through it. Okay. Okay. But it's just another sighting of her on surveillance. And she dropped her belongings, which is not a good yep. sign. Okay. Police say there's also surveillance footage of Lauren falling again, basically where she fell flat on her face because she was Ugh. too drunk to, you know, like catch Brace herself. Because normally yeah. you put your hands out. And at one point, and we don't know if this came from a witness account or surveillance footage, but Corey apparently took Lauren and slung her over his shoulder in a firearms carry, fireman's carry. That's the worst. Yeah. So, you know, some people say that this maybe indicates that he was more, like, coherent than she was. But I would argue that it doesn't necessarily mean that because, you know, guys are strong. And so, I don't know. Maybe it could indicate that, but I don't think that it 100% means that. I feel like his responses throughout the night kind of prove that too, though. Because, like, he's... Yeah, that's Like, he's probably intoxicated, but he's probably, like... He was buying her drinks at the bar. He probably was not matching her on those drinks. You know what I mean? Right. That's just my assumption. Anyway. Yeah. So he, you know, at one point did this and they were supposedly headed back towards his townhouse. Okay. So from there on out, we have no more surveillance footage. Mm. So the rest of this is all from witness accounts. But this is kind of, I'm going to go through it as if we're like, OK, this is the story. OK. And then we'll talk about some of the possible inconsistencies later. OK. So Lauren and Corey arrived back at Corey's apartment where his roommate, Mike Beth, was still awake. And Corey was very intoxicated, according to Mike. He was apparently stumbling around and he even ended up vomiting on the carpet on the way upstairs. Ew. (laughs) And some people say that could be from the drinking or it also could be from getting hit in the head. or True. That's true. Yeah. So Mike got Corey into bed. Because he was like, you're too drunk, you need to go to bed. And then he says that he tried to convince Lauren to sleep over because she was clearly very drunk. And he said that Lauren was just having none of it. She wanted to go back to her apartment and she was even trying to get Mike to go to her apartment with her to have a few more drinks. (sighs) But Mike did not think this was a good idea. Thank you, Mike. Right. So at 3.30 a.m., he called his neighbor and Lauren's friend Jay to ask him to take care of Lauren. Okay. Because, you know, he's like, I don't know this girl. Like, I tried to get her to go to bed. She doesn't want to. I'm not going to her apartment. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So eventually he escorted Lauren over to Jay's apartment and went home. So Jay says that Lauren was visibly very drunk. And he also said that she had a bruise under her eye. But when he asked her how she got it, she couldn't remember. Okay. So, you know, that, again, just shows you how drunk she was because it was probably from one of those falls she took. Right. Face planning. But she can't even remember. Mm. There's not a ton of information on what happened in the next hour or so, but around 4.15 a.m., two calls were placed from Jay's phone. And according to Jay, he can't remember, but they were made by either by Lauren or by Jay on behalf of Lauren. Like, it was for Lauren because she realized she didn't have her phone. Okay. And we don't um, know who one of the calls was to, but we know one was to her friend David Roan, and then the other one, it just said to a friend, and we don't know who that that is. Okay. Both calls went unanswered, and no messages were left. At 4.30 a.m., Jay reported that Lauren left his apartment. He said that he saw her at the intersection of 11th Street and College Avenue headed south on College, which was towards her apartment. So he believed that she was walking the two blocks back to her apartment 
and this is the last known sighting of Lauren. Mm. So, you know, we can get into this more later, but don't ever let anyone walk home alone. Yeah. God, Jay. Even if they're not drunk? No. Especially a woman. Like, yeah. it's, it's sad that we even have to say that. I mean, no one should walk home alone, but, like, especially a woman. Yeah. No matter how coherent or drunk they are. Right. So, that's the timeline that has been developed of, you know, t- the night of June 2nd, early morning of June 3rd. Later that morning, like a normal morning time, Jesse, Lauren's boyfriend, had texted her but hadn't heard back. So by early afternoon, he still hadn't heard back, and an employee from Kilroy's, where Lauren had left her phone, actually texted him back on her phone to let him know that her phone was there. Oh, that was nice. So of course, he freaked out. Yeah. Because he's like, okay, she doesn't have her phone. So he then reached out to Lauren's roommate, Hadir Tamir, and he actually went to Hadir's class to borrow her keys to, to their apartment. So that he could go check on Lauren. He, you know, was hoping that, you know, maybe she was just sleeping it off. She was still asleep. And she just didn't have her phone. So she hadn't messaged him. So he went straight over there. But she was not there. Yeah. And when he realized that, he called some of their friends. And then they both, or him and the friends, called Lauren's family. And then also called the police to report her missing. So this was around 4.30 p.m. on June 3rd. Okay. Lauren's parents, who lived in New York, immediately started calling hospitals in the Bloomington area to look for Lauren. And the next day, on June 4th, they arrived in Bloomington from New York to find Lauren. And I guess his friend never said, oh, yeah, by the way, I ran into Lauren last night and punched this guy in the face. (laughs) Yeah, not right away, at least. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the investigation began and police started questioning all the people who had seen or talked to Lauren that night. They started pulling surveillance footage and piecing the story together. As the investigation developed, many people, Lauren's parents included, questioned whether Lauren actually left the townhouses that night. Mm -hmm. Now, there were surveillance cameras around the townhouses, but apparently they weren't working. Of, of course. course they weren't. Of course they weren't. Yeah. That, I was going to ask that because I was. you said that was the last time anyone saw her. I was like, there was, was there no CCTV on any of the streets between the two blocks? From yeah. The, so that's, know. that's one of the things. So okay. other than Mike's account that we have that she went to Jay's and then Jay's account that she left the building, we don't know for sure that she didn't leave. Now, Like you just said, although those cameras were malfunctioning, this area is surrounded by bars and restaurants and places that did have surveillance cameras. But from what has been released by the police, there is no evidence of Lauren walking around that area after that last sighting of her on the walk to the townhouses. Okay. And we technically, as far as physical evidence, don't even know that she did get back into the townhouses. But a lot of people more people tend to trust Mike's account of what happened compared to Corey and Jay's just because he was seemingly he's been less sober. suspicious. Yeah. He was more sober, all of that. Yeah. Okay. So, the you know, we, we don't know technically she made it, but the last surveillance footage was right around the corner and Mike and Jay both claimed that she was back there. And also to, to play devil's advocate, <laughs> I know you like to say that. Um, yep. I mean, my line. we could, we, I don't think we can completely put it past Mike to cover for his roommate either. So, correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we'll, like, I don't know if I'm going to get into it how soon, but okay. Lauren's parents tend to think that they are covering something up. Okay. I could see that. Yeah. But, to play devil's advocate myself, we don't know that there isn't footage of this. There very well may be, and the police may just right. haven't released this. That seems a little less likely to me because even if they weren't going to release the actual footage, just saying we know for sure she left, I feel like would be huge in helping right. the public, you know, if they knew anything. But, you know, we don't know for sure. 
that there isn't any footage, but it is something to note. And I think that's one of the reasons this case gets so complicated and is so frustrating to so many because it's like there was so much surveillance footage of her. Yeah. Yet we somehow didn't capture her leaving this apartment. So did she never leave the apartment? Did she and there somehow didn't get caught on footage? Who knows? Yeah. So the theory that maybe she never left is one of the many, many theories in this case, many of which we will dive into. But first, I want to talk about kind of what happened after she was reported missing um, and as the investigation started to develop. The investigation did start pretty quickly. Her name and photo got spread around social media very quickly. And this was kind of one of the earlier cases that started to get spread around social media. Um, I know, I think actually uh, Allison, the person that suggested this case, said that she had like see- followed this on Twitter when it happened. I could be wrong about that, so I'm sorry if I am, but okay. I know that it like really did get spread around social media a lot. Just four days after Lauren disappeared, police came out and said that they did suspect foul play. They didn't name any suspects or persons of interest, but they did say that they believed foul play was involved. Although the police didn't name them, it didn't take very long for the public to think that some of the men that were with Lauren that night may have been involved in her disappearance. So Jesse being the boyfriend, obviously, again, even though he wasn't named by the police at all, people were suspecting Suspicious. did something happen. Yeah. So his parents actually came to Indiana and brought him back to New York Some people found this suspicious because this was only a couple days after Lauren disappeared. So people are like, why would you take him home, you know, if his girlfriend is missing? But I don't really blame them because we have seen time and time again, people get coerced into saying something. Right. So him going home and being able to be interviewed with either his parents or a lawyer present doesn't really bother me. You know, maybe his parents couldn't come and stay out in Indiana while the investigation was happening because they have jobs. Mm -hmm. And so they had to, but they didn't want him to be alone because they were worried that he would get into something, you know. And who knows, like, what his mental state was. I mean, his girlfriend of, what, four years? Three years, but he had known her forever. Yeah, had just gone missing and is missing still. I mean, he could be a complete and total mess and not even able to, like, care for himself, you know? Exactly. So I don't find that that suspicious. Yeah, I don't either. And honestly, same thing with the other guys getting lawyers. They did lawyer up pretty quickly, but they did still talk to police. Like, it wasn't like Brian Laundrie, where he lawyered up and just wouldn't say a thing after Gabby Petito went missing. They still willingly talked to police. Some of them talked to police before they got lawyers. And then once they got lawyers, they still talked to their talk to police just their lawyers were there which i think is safe and smart and i don't i don't find that suspicious at all on june 7th so four days later police entered lauren's apartment to search and it's been reported that a very small amount of cocaine was found in her apartment Mm. lauren's parents said that they'd never known lauren to experiment with drugs but they also said you know she's in college You know, we can't say that she didn't do anything. Right. One thing that they did find in her apartment was her heart medication. So this solidified for almost everybody that she had not run away. You know, most people didn't think that, but it's always a possibility. But seeing that, a lot of people were like, there's no way she would have taken this medication if she did So this obviously made her parents very worried because if she was still alive, like if she had been kidnapped or something, she was out there without this medication and that That could be very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. While at her apartment, law enforcement took three hard drives. This was likely to start developing a story, suspects, persons of interest. You know, most of what they had learned up to this point was through interviews with her friends and her boyfriend and her family. So they need to develop their own idea of who Lauren was, who she knew, etc. So that's probably what they took this computer equipment for. It doesn't okay. seem like they were finding anything that was like, oh my gosh, this bombshell in the case. Right. They also obtained the security footage from her complex, and so that's how they pieced together some of the timeline I talked about earlier. Law enforcement was receiving a ton of tips, and one they received was an anonymous tip that Lauren may be in Lake Monroe, which was nearby. 
So on Wednesday, June 8th, they searched Lake Monroe with divers, but unfortunately, they did not find anything. Mm. Public searches were also happening during this time. Police announced that they were investigating and interviewing people, especially Corey, Mike, Jay, and Jesse. And it has been reported that all three of the, or all four of the men took polygraph tests, but they were private polygraphs, but they all passed. And from what I could find, they never took police polygraphs, which like, I don't blame them. I'm not a fan of polygraph tests. Like, I'm like 95% sure if I took a polygraph test, I would (laughs) fail it no matter what, just because like I have anxiety. Yeah. So I'm typically like anytime a polygraph test is talked about, I typically ignore it. Yeah. So I don't think that it means anything. You know, they're not admissible in court. They can be very inaccurate. And they did take these private tests. And one of the uh, podcasts that I was listening to in preparation for, you know, and doing my research, it's a podcast called Crime Weekly. And they talked about this case. And one of the hosts is a former detective. So he, you know, has done this type of stuff. And he said oftentimes defense attorneys will have their client take a polygraph test, like a private polygraph test to see like, okay, are they lying or are they telling the truth? And he said that if the client fails, they just never release it. But if they pass, they're like, see, look, look, he passed it. Yeah. So I don't, I don't blame them for not taking the police polygraph test because if like they failed those just because of them being inaccurate or anxiety or whatever, then everybody would be like, oh my God, they're, they're guilty. Guilty. So, yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit about Corey Rossman and how he was acting after Lauren disappeared. Hmm. So Corey's attorney, Carl Salzman, claimed that he had sustained a concussion from being punched by Zach Oaks. They said that because of this concussion, he couldn't remember what happened the rest of the night. But in 2013, Corey told the Journal News of Westchester, New York, that he never said that he lost his memory from that night. He said, quote, you're taking statements that were said by my lawyer. I never said I did or didn't, which is interesting. Why wouldn't he clear it up? Like he just said, I I never said if I did or didn't. Why wouldn't he just say I did lose my memory or I didn't lose my memory? And why would that matter? And if the lawyer was claiming that, did they have medical proof to back that up? I have no clue. I've never seen anything about medical proof. And it's like, wouldn't it be better for you? To stick with what the lawyer said that you lost your memory because it's like, okay, you don't remember unless you're going to come out and say, actually, I do remember. And here's what happened. Right. He didn't do that. He Mm. just said, no, I didn't. I never said that. He also told the Journal News in 2013 that he had fully cooperated with police and he claimed that he was being harassed by Lauren's parents. He said, quote, it's inappropriate the way they're harassing people that are also victims in this case. We've done nothing wrong. If we'd done something wrong, we would have been arrested already. Not true. (laughs) Yeah. Not true. No. And this is like Lauren's parents responded and they they said, we have never spoken with Corey. They've asked and asked themselves to speak with Corey and Corey has refused to speak with them. His lawyer even stood them up when they had set a meeting with him. Charlene Spear, Lauren's mom, said, quote, The private investigators have never spoken to Corey, so I don't know how it is we're harassing him other than asking him to talk to the Bloomington Police Department. All mm. of them. Meaning all the guys. Right. But specifically Corey. He's the only one who has not spoken to Lauren's parents through all of this. Jesse did. Jay did. I'm not 100% sure Mike did, but I don't think many people suspected Mike necessarily, but I right. think he did speak with them. And Corey spent the most time with her that evening, so... Exactly. Why not just talk to them and get it over with, unless you have something to hide? Yep. Hmm. Okay. So at this point, Charlene and Rob Spear did believe that the individuals that were with Lauren that night knew more than what they were telling police. They accused Corey and the others of withholding information from police and creating a, quote, pact of silence. Mm. So that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, where, you know, they're kind of thinking maybe something happened and they're all covering for each other. Yeah, which is so fucked up. Mm -hmm. If that's true. Yes. 
On August 16th, 2011, a nine-day search at the Sycamore Ridge landfill began by the Bloomington police, the IU police, and the FBI. So this landfill was where trash from Bloomington was sent, and there was hope that maybe something connected to Lauren's disappearance would be found there. They combed through 4,100 tons of garbage over the nine days. Oh, my Lord. But from everything I could find, they didn't find anything. They didn't find anything in the search. Okay. In September 2011, Richard Bo Deedle, the head of a private investigation firm that the Spears hired, went on Good Day New York. So Bo Deedle, as he goes by, <laughs> he is a former New York detective who founded his own PI firm when he retired. And his firm had been hired by the Spear family to look into Lauren's case. Because it's now been a couple months. No real leads. Police haven't found anything. Whatever. Right. Bo Deedle said that the Bloomington police was not letting the PI investigators in on the investigation at all when he was on Good Day New York. But he later made a public apology saying he sometimes opens his mouth without thinking first. Wow. So in response to this, Bloomington police... Uh, the Bloomington police chief, he said that they had sat down with the PI firm, but, quote, a police partnership with a private agency is unethical and contrary to standard police practice and standard policy is to not reveal pertinent information to anybody outside of law enforcement. Yeah. Which I get that because it, it had only been a couple months. You know, they're still probably interviewing people and working through yeah. all of this. But I also get their frustration, like Bo Deedle's frustration and the Spear family's frustration because they're trying, they hired this PI and they're still not getting anywhere. Yeah. So there aren't really any major leads at this point. Jesse Wolf had spoken with the Spears, but he graduated college in December and he went back to New York. And according to one report that I read, he essentially cut off all communication with the family, which made the Spears sad because it was like, you know, Lauren had been Aww. in his family's lives for a while. Yeah. He had been in their lives for a while. But again, you know, he was probably in a very rough state. He lost the love of his life. True. And I'm sure. And then he was also on top of just losing her. He was being accused by people, even if it wasn't directly the Spears. He probably needed that distance. Yeah. On January 17th, 2012, the Spears celebrated what would have been Lauren's 21st birthday. They said around this time that they did not think that Lauren had been experimenting with drugs and gotten hurt that way. So they're saying we don't think that drugs played a part in her disappearance. They believed that she had surrounded herself with people who did not have her best interest at heart. Yeah. They said that they wished each young man would sit down and speak with them about why they had been so quiet and what exactly happened that night. They also wished that they the men would take police polygraph tests because they questioned the accuracy of the private ones they had apparently taken. So, you know, the Spears basically just, I think, feel like they're not telling the truth and they're just frustrated that they can't talk to them. I don't blame them because, like, if you have nothing to hide, you would come forward and just try to help this family. Exactly. Like, what do you have to lose, you know? Like, yeah. A little bit of time. Like, who cares? That's what bothers me the most about Corey. Because yeah. it's like, you you were with her the most that night. Duh, they want to talk to you. Like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> it's an Amazon package. Oh. I think it's my Christmas pillow covers. Yay. All good, buddy. Mackie, all He's good. He's like, no, it's not. Someone's here and they're going to get us. <laughs> <laughs> Not much happened in the investigation for the next year. In February 2013, the reward money had been raised from 100000 to 200000 for any information leading to Lauren's disappearance or information about Lauren's disappearance. Right. But this unfortunately did not bring any more credible tips in. Mm. And the next couple of years brought almost no movement in the case and the search for Lauren. But that is where we will pick up next episode 
Okay. So there is just so much more to dive into with this case, so many theories and leads. And as I said at the beginning, I have gone down so many rabbit holes. So (laughs) I needed to split this into two so I could fully go through everything. So be sure to tune in Thursday for the next episode all about all the theories and the rest of the investigation over the last eight years. Wow. It gets really crazy. So you guys will not want to miss that. So we'll see you on Thursday. And until then, keep it human. Bye.